Muchas gracias por este, uh, por estar aquí. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I will give this in English. <laughs> um, so, okay, and I will take off my headphone for now. Um, okay, this talk is um, about things that you may not usually hear. Um, so it's intended to be thought-provoking. Um, I don't believe in telling people just facts that you need to memorize, but that you should always question things. So I will you know, tell you things from a different point of view. And I know I probably have too many slides, um, but I will uh, look at and see if you look interested. And um, if you don't, I will skip to another topic. So if you want to look really sleepy, we can make this very short. <laughs> um, the, the field of network protocols is very confusing. Why are there so many protocols? And what's the difference between a new version of a protocol and a different protocol? These are sort of very deep questions that even people in the industry sort of never really think about. So my general philosophy when I want to design a protocol is because I really dislike technology, I, I do not have a smartphone, uh, I, um, I don't like gadgets, I like things that are really, really easy to use. So when I design something, I make it just work so you don't have to know anything. It's just auto-configuring. So that's how I did it originally, and then people told me, Radia, we have some customers that really enjoy configuring things. So for that, I say, okay, if you want knobs to, to play with, I'll give you knobs, but you don't have to touch them. It'll work without touching them, and no matter what setting you have on the knobs, it will still work. So I think that's sort of the right way to design things. Um, now, getting to network protocols, a lot of stuff that everybody knows is actually false. Um, so things are just so confusing. When you have two competing technologies, A and B, I like to really understand what's actually different between them. And so when I try to investigate, I get two huge specs in incomprehensible jargon and trying to compare them, um, nobody understands both of them. So if I were to um, try to save myself some work and I ask somebody who's an expert in A how A compares with B, since nobody knows both of them, the person who's an expert in A will say, A is awesome and B sucks. <laughs> and of course, if you ask someone um, who knows about B, they'll say the opposite thing. Um, another thing that happens is people invent a buzzword, and people hear it so much because it's marketed, and there's, the buzzword doesn't mean anything, but people assume it must mean something because you hear it all the time. Um, the other th thing is that A and B can change. So um, if you find out something about B that's better than A, and you explain that to the A people, well, no problem. They steal the ideas, and they still claim A is better. So when you think of standards committees, you probably think they are well-educated technologists that are carefully judging engineering trade-offs of various design options. But a much more accurate way to think of it is as sports fans that are drunk. <laughs> so um, what about facts? So suppose you're trying to compare A and B, and you measure it, and you discover that A takes more power than B. That actually doesn't mean anything, because what are you actually measuring? You're measuring one implementation of A against one implementation of B. So if somebody tells me A takes more power, I measured it, the only way I will believe it 
is if I can understand something intrinsic to the technology that would make sense as to why would one would use more power than the other. Um, so don't believe anything unless you can understand some intrinsic property that would make something true. The way networking tends to be taught is, is very frustrating to me. Um, it's taught as if the only thing the students need to do is to start implementing the current standards. So it's presented as um, if TCP IP arrived on tablets from the sky in its awesome perfection. Nothing else ever existed and possibly a book or a, a professor will mention another standards body like ISO, but the only purpose of mentioning it is so that everyone can giggle about what morons they were. <laughs> So my philosophy on teaching and, and books and designing things is to look at each problem, don't get confused with the actual uh, details of any particular committee, and so focus on one thing, like if you plug into a network, how do you get an address? And then I say, well, okay, here's seven different approaches I could imagine. And um, then you compare them. Um, and you say, well, you know, this has more overhead, but it's more um, auto-configuring. And then you can say, and by the way, IPv4 does it this way, IPv6 does it this way, IPX did it this way, Apple Talk does it, you know, did it this way, and so forth. And I think it's much more interesting to students to see the variety of ways that things have worked or could work. Um, but I've been told that, Sometimes professors look at my books, which are written that way, and say, why, um, why are you talking about Apple Talk? My students don't need to know Apple Talk. As if students have a very small brain, and if you fill it with any knowledge that when a recruiter asks them, do you know this, do you know that, if it's not on the list, then it's useless knowledge. But if all you want them to understand is, let's say, IPv4, they will have a much deeper ability to understand it. And if they ever need to design something, it's much better if they see a bunch of examples. So now I'm going to talk about some specific internet stuff. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the story of IPv6, which you know, what we learn about is, wow, you know, this is an amazing, brilliant discovery. Um, you know, just absolutely new stuff that um, never was thought about before, and it's so exciting. Um, but let me sort of demystify that. So people talk, well, another thing that everybody is so confused about is they talk about layer two solutions and layer three solutions. So what is that all about? And I'll explain how Ethernet and IP kind of work together um, because it, they didn't need to, it, um, but I'll explain that. So first we need to review network layers. So the standards body ISO is credited with naming the layers. You don't have to take them terribly seriously. Um, most things are not implemented as strict layers but it's just a good way to think about networking. Now, I'm going to give my own kind of uh, variant of the ISO layers. Um, layer one is the physical layer. It's how do you signal a bit? What does the connector look like? Layer two is how you get a message to somebody who's a neighbor who's on the same link as you are. Layer three is you create an entire path and you forward the data through a network. And layer four is sort of from the source to the destination, numbering messages, retransmitting them if they get lost. And that is um, uh, sort of like TCP. And layers five and above are boring. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I call it Perlman's layers. <laughs> so what's a layer three protocol? Um, it's not rocket science. It's you just put your data in an envelope and put on a source and a destination, 
and a hop count. And the reason for the hop count is that in a distributed algorithm, if the topology is changing, there might be a while when everybody's forwarding tables are not all compatible and packets may loop around, in which case it's a good idea to be able to count how many times the packet has looped and you can get rid of it um, eventually. So this is what a layer three packet looks like. It's very simple. That's basically what IPv4 looked like. It's basically what IPv6 looks like. The size of the address has changed. Now I'm going to have to give you some background on ethernet. Um, so an ethernet packet also looks the same. You have a destination and a source. Now you'll notice there's no hop count there, which is how it differs from a layer three. Why is there no hop count? It's not because the ethernet designers didn't know about hop counts. It's because it never occurred to them that anyone would forward an ethernet packet. Ethernet was intended to be layer two, only between um, um, nodes on the same link. So what's the difference between Ethernet and IP? Because they both involve putting your data in an envelope with a source and a destination. So as I said, Ethernet was intended not to be forwarded, just to go on a single hop. Um, the original invention of Ethernet was known as CSMA CD. It was a way um, of sharing bandwidth on a single wire. So the MA part means multiple access, means you know, understand you're sharing the bandwidth. CD, oh, well, CS is carrier sense, which means don't be rude. If you wanna talk, first wait until no one else is talking and then talk. And CD is collision detect, um, saying that even if you're talking, if somebody else happens to talk at the same time, you'll stop. Um, so there's lots of papers about how if there's too many nodes trying to talk at the same time, you get so many collisions, you can't get more than about 60% of the bandwidth in use. Um, and it's limited in terms of the number of nodes, maybe a thousand nodes, and, and limited in terms of the number, the, the distance. Now these papers are completely scientifically valid, but none of that is true today because Ethernet has not been CSMA CD for decades. So all of that stuff has nothing to do with Ethernet. Ethernet actually died decades ago. You have a connector on your machine, it's called Ethernet, but the only uh, thing it has to do with the original invention was the packet format. So um, what is Ethernet today? Well, the way that it completely changed from being a shared link to being sort of an attempt at doing a layer three protocol was, um, um, this was sort of a very personal uh, story that I lived through. Um, Ethernet came out and it was so bright and shiny and exciting that um, people thought it was instead of layer three. And I was in charge of layer three. At, um, and so I went and they were building applications directly on Ethernet. So I, um, was saying, no, Ethernet is not a network, it's just a link in a network, and you still need layer three. And they said, oh, go away, Radia, you're just upset because no one needs your layer anymore. <laughs> and I said, but you may want to talk from one Ethernet to another. And they said, our customers would never want to do that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Here I was um, in a bad mood about the whole thing um, when my manager says to me, Radio, we need to design a magic box that will sit between two ethernets and let somebody on one talk to somebody on the other, which is of course um, a router, but a router only works if the end node puts, is doing the same layer three protocol as the router. Um, so the constraint, we had to invent a box that was not allowed to modify the ethernet packet in any way. There was also a hard length limit to it. And um, we could not depend on the end nodes doing anything that they would do other than just being on a single link. So the basic idea was, um, here's how the spanning tree algorithm came about. So um, the basic idea is you have this box 
that listens promiscuously on all of its ports and stores the packet, and when the ether is free on the other ports, it forwards them. And in addition, it can be smart and learn when it receives a packet on this port, uh, it looks at the source address so that later on, if it has a packet um, addressed in this case to A, that, um, does, oh yeah, um, if it has a packet addressed to A, and J were to send a packet with destination address A, it won't need to forward it. Or if A sends a packet for X, it knows it only needs to forward it on this link. Um, whoops, what happened? So, um, the idea, this only works if there's only one way to get from any place to any other place. So the idea was, um, and that my manager challenged me to do, was to take something that's plugged together just any which way and have the, the round circles, which are the bridges, gossip among themselves and figure out a loop-free subset of the topology. So they take this and then turn off some of their ports so there's only one way to get from any place to any other place. So, you know, the story of this is that um, he thought it was going to be hard um, and he was gone the whole next week. So he asked me about this on a Friday. That night I realized it was incredibly simple. Actually, everything I've ever done is incredibly simple. Um, and um, then, um, so I realized exactly how to do it, you know, could come up with a formal proof even that it worked. Monday and Tuesday I wrote the specification in enough detail that the implementers got it working in very short time without asking me a single question. And then, because my manager was gone all week, I couldn't concentrate on anything else, so I spent the remainder of the week working on the poem that goes along with the algorithm. And it's the abstract of the paper in which I published the algorithm. So it's called algorime, because every algorithm should have an algorime. And the poem is, I think that I shall never see a graph more lovely than a tree. A tree whose crucial property is loop-free connectivity. A tree which must be sure to span so packets can reach every LAN. First the root must be selected. By ID it is elected. Least cost paths from root are traced. In the tree these paths are placed. A mesh is made by folks like me. Then bridges find a spanning tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's now that Ethernet can go lots and lots of hops, why, why isn't Ethernet a, a reasonable replacement for layer three? And the reason, spanning tree does not give optimal paths. Some links are idle, others are overutilized. Now, there's a new thing that I'll, I'll just mention briefly called Trill which um, I'll, I'll talk about in a few slides, that fixes that so that you can um, have a cloud with Ethernet that has optimal paths um, and path splitting and anything you would do with layer three. Um, but there's also no way to summarize the addresses. The addresses are flat, which is nice because it means that within the Ethernet cloud, you can move around and keep your address but it's bad in terms of trying to make the entire internet built out of it because it won't scale beyond some modest size cloud. So at any rate, given that everybody has implemented IP as a layer three in all of their network stacks, why haven't we gotten rid of this years ago? Why do we still have both ethernet and IP? We actually shouldn't need it because all, Ethernet doesn't have shared links anymore. It's all point, you know, two guys talking on a wire with a spanning tree bridge in between. So the reason that we haven't replaced it is something that you, know, you will not hear ordinarily because you're, you're taught to believe that IP is just perfection itself. But indeed, IP, is not a very good layer three protocol. Um, now, what's, uh, there were a lot of different layer three protocols at the time, and IP won out. 
not because it was technically better. It might have been the worst of all of the ones technically, but it had to do with which ones had free implementations um, and you know so forth. So it's sort of like English may win out as the language, and it's not because English is a great language. <laughs> you could certainly design a better language, but um, yeah. So um, the problem with IP is that it's very configuration intensive because every link has to have its own block of addresses. So um, if you have a block of addresses, of IP addresses, and you want to number the nodes in your network, you have to chop up the address space to give a unique block to each link. Each router has to be configured with which address blocks are on which port. And if you, a node moves from one link to another, it has to change its address. So um, also, when you're sending IP and you get to the last link, you have to do this ARP protocol in order to get the Ethernet address on the last cloud, um, which has significant flooding overhead. Now, Layer 3 does not have to work that way. There was a competitor to Layer 3 done by ISO, and um, it was called CLNP, which stands for Connectionless Network Layer Protocol. Um, when I was in charge of DECnet Layer 3, it had two byte addresses, which were kind of too small. So when um, we were thinking of making it bigger, we decided, hey, no reason to invent our own packet format. ISO's packet format is fine. So we went from the two byte DECnet address to the ISO uh, format. So both DECnet and CLNP have the same format because we use theirs. So in, in that format, an address is 20 bytes long. And remember, IPv6 is 16 bytes. This one is 20 bytes. And the way that it works is that the top 14 bytes is a prefix shared by all nodes in a large cloud. So, um, and then the bottom six bytes is your address inside of that cloud. And um, so if you do hierarchy the way IP does, you have to, and you have a block of addresses, say everything starting with two, you have to chop up your address space, have a unique um, a a block on each link. The routers have to be configured. Whereas if you instead take you know, this entire enterprise, and they built, you know, very large things um, with one layer of this, um, um, you know, like hundreds of thousands of nodes. Um, if you do it, whoops, this way, then um, these guys inside, the routers don't need any configuration, and you can move around within it. And the end nodes help out by saying where they are so that inside the cloud, the routers know how to route to the um, exact guy. So the single worst decision in the history of mankind is that in 1992, people said, hey, you know, IPv4 addresses are too small. We need something with bigger addresses. And so they said, hey, why don't we replace it with CLNP? All of the vendors had implemented it. People showed that there was no trouble running TCP and internet applications on top of it. Um, imagine how easy it would have been to convert to bigger addresses in 1992. The internet was just some small researchy thing. Um, also, IPv4 had not invented, which it had to do out of necessity, these things like DHCP and NAT. Um, so at that point, if you had told somebody convert to CLNP, they'd say, why? And you'd say, you get auto configuration. And they'd go, wow, that's really cool. But now you get auto configuration with IPv4 as well. So it's, um, all you can say is you get bigger addresses and someone says, I, what's an address? Why do I care? Um, and, you know, it's, plus the um, internet is so mission critical and so huge. So, um, um, if, will IPv6 save us? Um, and 
Unfortunately, IPv6 acts the same way as IPv4, which every link has its own prefix. So you're still going to want um, to have IP to get you to a cloud, because you want to have some uh, cloud with virtualization that you can move around, and you'll still want to have Ethernet. So um, um, I said I would mention Trill. Uh, Trill is an IETF standard. It's a way of taking a spanning tree-based Ethernet, replacing any subset of your spanning tree bridges with Trill switches, and the more you replace, the better bandwidth utilization you get. Um, but you don't have to throw everything away and get a new thing. So Trill will improve Ethernet, but we still would have been much better off with CLNP. So with CLNP, you use the top 14 bytes of your address to get to a particular cloud, and then there's no need for ARP because the bottom six bytes, which is the address you use inside the cloud, is part of your 20-byte address. Whereas with IP, even if you fix the suboptimal routing within a cloud by using Trill, um, you'll use the IP address to get to the cloud, and this would be IPv4 or IPv6, and once you're inside, oh, oh, and then once you get to the cloud, you have to do ARP in order to get the address within the cloud, and then um, you can route within the cloud. So Trill plus IP is trying to do almost as well as you could have with CLNP. So um, what I've said, I'm going to summarize this. Adopting bigger addresses would have been way easier in 1992 than today. Um, um, if we had done that, the internet would have migrated to bigger addresses successfully 20 years ago. Um, you know, imagine how much it has cost the industry that people, um, oh, why didn't they do it? Well, just some, as I said, sports fans. Imagine sports fans who've drunk too many beers. You know, it was, um, the kinds of things they said was, you, you're, you're suggesting we rip the heart out of the internet and put in a foreign substance. Um, it, you know, which is, there's nothing more, uh, no way in which IPv6 is more similar to IPv4 than CLNP would have. There's, there's, you know, it was just very strange. Now, I put this in red so that people don't, you know, quote me outside of here saying, Radia is saying we shouldn't do IPv6. We do need to do IPv6. Um, we need bigger addresses. The longer we wait, the more painful it's going to be. Um, I'm not saying IPv6, I mean, certainly CLNP would have been better than IPv6, but it's too late now. Let's, let's not, you know, with it, politically it will confuse the industry so much, so the only direction we can go to at this point is IPv6. And it's totally amazing that the internet works as well as it does today with IPv4. So repeating, yes, we should convert to IPv6. It is better than IPv4. So another topic. Here I'm going to give you an example where being magnanimous and adopting um, something from another standards organization was the wrong thing to do. And the example I'm going to give is PKIX, which is an IETF standard for a certificate. So first, some background. Maybe you all know, but um, a quick refresher. What's a certificate? <laughs> well, with public key cryptography, each user has a pair of numbers that are kind of inverses of each other, and you can tell everybody your public key, and somehow they can't figure out your private key. And if you know my public key and I know my private key, I can prove to you that I know my private key um, without your needing to know it. And you can send me encrypted things that I can decrypt. But how do you know my key and the, um, my public key? And the way you know it is with this thing known as a certificate, which is a message signed by this thing called a CA, a certification authority, that signs a statement saying, um, Alice's public key is this number. So um, if Alice has a certificate she, uh, and wants to talk to Bob, she sends the certificate to Bob. Bob 
knows, it has to know the CA's public key. Therefore, it can verify the CA's signature. And now he knows Alice's public key. Um, Bob can send Alice his certificate. Now each of them can do encryption, authentication, and all that. So what's a certificate? Um, it's really very simple. You just take a name and a key, and the CA signs it. So why should it matter what format you use? So, um, so the PKICS working group in IETF decided to base the standards on X509, which was an ITU standard, which is another standards body. And ordinarily, sure, great, why invent something when a perfectly good thing is there? The problem with X509 is that X509 maps an X500 name to a public key. So what's an X500 name? It's a perfectly reasonable namespace, but that's not what we're using. So um, the way an X500 name looks like is it has all of these pieces, and each piece has a type. So it's typically C equals, where C says what the country is, O equals what your organization is, OU is what your organization unit is, whatever that is. Um, CN is a common name. Um, so X509 would have been fine if internet protocols and internet users were using X500 names, but they don't. They use DNS names, like labs.examplecompanyname.com. So what good is something that maps some string that the application and user is unfamiliar with to a public key? So an example, the human types foo.com, um, which is a DNS name embedded in a URL, and the site sends a certificate with an X500 name. So um, you type, you know, Amazon.com, and you get back a certificate. So your browser receives a certificate from the thing you're talking to, and it says C equals U.S., country equals U.S., O equals Attica prison, OU equals death row, OU equals particularly vile prisoners, CN equals horrible person. <laughs> and why shouldn't this person be able to have a certificate? And so there's that name in the certificate, and the CA makes sure that you are the owner of that name. But one strategy used by some implementations is, I mean, was or maybe even is, that it ignores the string inside the name string in the certificate because it doesn't know how to match that up with a DNS name. So if it's going to ignore the name there, but still do the math to verify that the signature is valid, what security are you getting? Um, only the warm, fuzzy feeling that someone paid VeriSign for a certificate, <laughs> but you have no idea who it is. So there are at least three kludgy ways of encoding a DNS name into um, a PKIX certificate. So one suggestion um, is that you take these components of the X500 name, and you invent a new thing. Instead of C equals, you make it DC equals, domain component. So if you want to encode um, you know, labs.intel.com, you'd say DC equals com, DC equals intel, DC equals labs, fine. There's another way, which is inside P uh, the PKIC certificate, there's a field where you can put alternate names. So you could put the DNS name there. And a third thing is where you can use the very bottom of a name, um, which is called the common name, um, which is really kind of not supposed to be part of the, the thing you have to prove to the CA, and put the DNS name there. So are having three ways of encoding a name better than one? No, it's a security risk waiting to happen. Because unless a CA makes sure that you own the DNS name encoded in any of these three ways, then there's a security risk. So suppose the CA assumes you're going to use the alternate name. And so when it's only willing to sign the certificate if you are the owner of the DNS name in the alternate name, but the browser implementation looks 
for the common name portion of the X500 name. So, okay, now another topic, a little less technical, human names. I'd love humans to be authenticated with certificates and keys. If all parents were as creative as my parents um, were, we wouldn't have this problem. Um, I am the only Radia Perlman on earth. <laughs> but I can't understand it when people are pregnant, they have nine months and um, to come up with a name and then you know you ask them four months into it, have you come up with a name? And they say, well, not yet, we're still thinking. Eight months into it, you say, have you come up with a name? And they say, yes, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when you're in a big company, there's always lots of people with the same name. So when you want to send email or um, to somebody, um, is it John Smith? Is it Johnny Smith? Is it John.Q.Smith? Now, if it were up to me and I had a company, when somebody was interviewing, I would look at the employee database, and if there was already a John Smith, then I'd tell the new person, sorry, we can't hire you. <laughs> and then parents would learn to be more creative with names. <laughs> but even all the math in the world, even if we solve the name problem, it won't help us know, uh, really know who or what to trust. There have been people with no credentials that successfully posed as airplane pilots and flew airplanes or doctors and did surgeries. Or even if they have the absolutely proper credentials, like Bernie Madoff, I'm not sure if you know who he was, but um, he was a famous um, you know, financial analyst person, um, and he pulled off the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, you know, stealing like, I mean, he, people would invest money with him and all he did was steal it. Um, <laughs> But also, we don't tend to search for things by DNS names anyway. So this is all so confusing. Uh, people tend to get uh, obsessed with the provable math behind the algorithms in the certificate or the format of the certificates. But there's sort of more fundamental issues that we have to really understand about trust. OK, so another topic. People say the internet is great for keeping everyone informed. There's an, uh, an, another side to that, which is that if there's too many choices of which information to look at, um, we can focus on just what we want to hear. So whatever bizarre conspiracy, whatever thing that you believe, you can find some community of 50 people across the planet that believe the same thing. You create a website, people write whatever they want, which reinforces to you, oh, that stuff might be, must be right because all these other people do it. And um, um, anyone can say anything and they have an audience that will believe them. And it's very, very scary. It actually polarizes society. So um, yes, you have a way of disseminating anything, but once you have enough wrong information polluting the right information, it's almost as if there's no information there anymore. Okay, so now on a more positive note, I'm going to talk about some things that can't possibly work, but they do. <laughs> so one is Wikipedia. <laughs> How can this possibly work? Anyone is allowed to edit it, and it's so huge that nobody can possibly be monitoring what's going on there. Um, and yet, when you want to look something up, it's usually the best source of a c concisely well-written summary of the thing that you want to look up. You know, by any logic, it should all be trashed with just cursing and, you know, whatever. It's just very weird. Um, internet search. If somebody had come to me 15 years ago or whatever, and I was a venture capitalist, and they said, I have a great idea for a company. I'm going to map ca and catalog everything on the internet so that you can search it. Um, 
quicker than you can search through your email on your own laptop, um, I would have told them, you know, this is ridiculous. There's no way this could possibly ever work. And even if by some miracle you could make it work, there's no way to make money at it. <laughs> Another one is online shopping. So when you want a particular brand of shoe, you just do a search and you get like 17 different places you can buy it from, all in different countries and you never heard of any of them. You pick the one with the lowest price, you give them your credit card, and shoes appear. <laughs> this is quite amazing. And even worse is eBay, where just random people post things, you pay them, and you, you get the thing. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to talk about something that should be like really easy, but, but doesn't seem to be done, and that's user authentication. So it's common when you're designing things to have to do a trade-off between usability and security. So you have this curve where the more usable it is, the less secure it is, and the more secure it is, the less usable it is. So that's common but we've managed to make user authentication both maximally insecure and maximally unusable. We've managed to find this sour spot on the graph. <laughs> so every site has different rules for usernames and passwords. Um, you know, one says it has to be at least N characters, no more than X characters, must have at least one letter, one number, etc. Um, there was a cute thing on, on the web that I wish that I knew who to attribute it to, but it says unknown. It says, sorry, but your password must contain an uppercase letter, a number, a haiku, a gang sign, a hieroglyph, and the blood of a virgin. <laughs> now, there's a bunch of annoying rules that add, oh, so if they had all the same rules, you could come up with some algorithm by which you could uh, figure out what password you were using at each site. But given that they all have these different rules, there's sort of nothing you can do. So um, um, there's annoying rules that do not add anything to security. Like one thing is where you must change your password at least every N days. This just is very annoying. Or you must not reuse a password. Um, at some sites, if you forget your password because you haven't visited it recently, you go through all of the un annoying ways of answering questions and so forth, and then it allows you to reset your password, but it won't let you reset, you know, once, that's the only time it will tell you what its rules are. Once it says, oh, you're not allowed to use exclamation points, I might be able to figure out, ah, I know what password I would have used, but they don't let you use the one you were just using. So it was perfectly secure to continue using it if you hadn't forgotten it. Once they verify that you are the same person, why can't you use the same password you were using before? They just seem to want to punish you for having forgotten it momentarily. So these sorts of rules actually lower security. So why do they do it? Is it because IT departments hate users and just want to punish them? <laughs> well, I actually accused an IT person of that. And um, they actually came up with a really good reason why they have to do that, which is that somebody made best practices document. And so if you're a big company and you do have a security breach, you have a good defense if you said, I followed everything in that document. But imagine if you try to explain to a jury that, well, I only followed seven of the 10 rules in that best industry practices document because the other three do not make sense. You know, so they really sort of have to follow these rules. User authentication. I do not want to hear we need better user training. <laughs> and so there's a quote from my security book. And um, so this, this, my books are like just the way that I talk. And um, even though they're sort of serious, they're books on serious technology, and 
deeply technical. They're also funny. So this is a quote from the security book, which is on cryptography and all that. Humans, humans are incapable of securely storing high quality cryptographic keys, and they have unacceptable speed and accuracy when performing cryptographic operations. They are also large, expensive to maintain, difficult to manage, and they pollute the environment. It is astonishing that these devices continue to be manufactured and deployed, but they are sufficiently pervasive that we must design our protocols around their limitations. <laughs> so, you have to design your system around humans. Don't expect humans to change in order to fit your system. So, the way single sign-on ought to work, I mean, it ought to be where you um, oh, yes, Sun Microsystems had a wonderful slogan called, the network is the computer. I don't know exactly what they meant by it, but it's the right vision that you log onto the network once and you can visit any sort of resource and authentication just sort of happens automatically. Oh, by the way, with that slogan, the network is the computer, I heard there was some meeting where people gave out t-shirts, and I just really wish I had one. And the t-shirt said, the network is the network, the computer is the computer, sorry for the confusion, Sun Microsystems. <laughs> but um, in terms of this attempt to do single sign-on, one strategy that I do not like is called an identity provider, which is one site that you authenticate to, and then any time you try to visit any other site, your browser goes back to that site and gets a little document signed by the identity provider saying, yeah, yeah, this is Radia, you can believe me. And that, I call that a token. So um, the token is a signed message by the identity provider saying that A vouches that whoever sends you this token is Alice. So what's the problem with this approach? Well, there's a security problem. Um, the identity provider can impersonate any user anywhere. And it's an online thing, so boy, if it has any bugs and somebody compromised it, everybody is compromised everywhere. Also, a stolen token that you get allows the thief of that token to impersonate you as well. Um, there's also a trust problem and a scalability problem. Is there really one identity provider that will be trusted by all users and all servers? Um, obviously not. So, you know, people are thinking, well, you'll have like thousands of these identity providers. How on earth are you going to match uh, finding one identity prover, uh, uh, provider that's trusted by both the user and the site? It, um, there's also an availability problem. If it's down, the user can't go anywhere. And a privacy problem, because the identity provider knows every site that you visit. So is there a solution? Yes, I believe so. For instance, a user should have a smart card with a private key. And when the user sets up an online account, uh, just like today, you put in all this information when you're creating your online bank, and then at the end, today, you give a username and a password. So that it, um, and all it really cares about is that later on when you visit the site, it's the same person that created the account originally. So instead of sending a username and password, your browser ought to send it a public key. And it can use that to authenticate you and identify you later. You don't need any certificates. Uh -huh. So, yeah, most of the time, all you're proving is that you're the same user that created the account. So, um, and things to consider on this sort of thing is the user does need to be able to use multiple different devices. If your smart card is stolen, it has to be unusable by the thief who stole it. And you have to be able to replace it with all the same secrets um, so that the user can replace it. And I think all of these problems can be solved. So, okay, so I can skip this ranting. Um, I was unsure whether I, um, and I just wanna talk really quickly about some security research because people ask what kind of things are you doing. 
So one thing, I call it assured delete. So you can have a file system or a storage system that when you give it a piece of data to store, you can give it an expiration date. So you say, here, store this, and I want you not to lose it for me until one year from today, and then I want it unrecoverable. And the storage system should be allowed to create as many backup copies as it wants so it can't accidentally lose it, but in one year, even though the backups still exist, this should not be um, um, recoverable. And so this system, like everything I've done, if you're curious, I can explain it to you, um, at, you know, after, uh, like, tomorrow or something. Um, it's no performance overhead, trivial to manage, and all that. And another thing um, was sort of my thesis, which is, oh, okay, um, oh, right, um, which was how to design a network that will continue working even if some of the switches are malicious. Um, so, okay, another topic is infected machines. There's so many ways to get your machine infected. It used to be you would just tell people, don't, uh, don't boot off of an infected floppy. But these days, it's don't read any PowerPoint document, <laughs> don't visit any website, don't open any email attachment. I mean, you, you know, it's... In the old days, um, people who were, you know, doing viruses and stuff were bored teenagers looking for attention. So they were perfectly happy if they crashed your machine. These days, it's organized crime. And there's an actual real business for infecting a lot of machines, and then you can control all of these infected machines to launch a denial of service attack or send spam. Um, um, or having available a lot of computation for password cracking. There's actually supposedly, you know, black market websites that you can rent a bot army. So there's a certain amount of money. It says, um, I have 10,000 bots, and if you want to do a denial of service, um, this is how much I charge per hour. By, and I always wondered, what money do you use to pay him. You know, you're a criminal, he's a criminal, but anyway. Um, but um, the, the scary thing is these criminals do not want you to know that your machine is infected. So how many machines actually are infected today? I mean, nobody really knows. Okay, so um, I'll just tell some of this stuff. The, in protocol folklore, there's there's obvious things in designing protocols that people just seem to get wrong. So one example is a version number. A lot of protocols have a version number field. So in IP, it's, it's right there. What's the purpose of the field? Is it decoration? <laughs> so, um, and then there's a philosophical question about what's a new version of a protocol, what's a version, new version versus a different protocol? So the only thing that makes sense to me is that there's, when you send a message, it's inside an envelope. And so for instance, the ethernet envelope has a protocol type field. If you're using a different protocol type, then it's a different protocol inside. But if you wanna share the same protocol type and differentiate two incompatible things based on version number, then it's a different version. So that's, that's something that makes sense, but the only way that works is, for instance, if you're doing IPv4, you can't just say, put a four there. You have to also say, when you receive a message, look at that, and if it's not a four, throw it away because you can't parse it. But that was not in the IPv4 spec. So um, people discovered that if you tried to use the same protocol type for IPv6, and sent an IPv6 packet to an IPv4 node, they would just, you know, try to parse it completely incorrectly. So IPv6 is actually a new protocol. It is not a new version of IPv4. Um, okay. Oh, and then just some silly things. The one thing you have to do is never move the, pro uh, the version number field. SSL not only assumed they could continue using the same port, but they moved the version number field, so. Okay, um, so I, I'll skip this one. 
Um, uh, another little thing is latency. If you want to minimize the amount of time that it takes for a message to get across your network, you don't want to do what's called store and forward, which is every switch has to receive the entire packet before it can start forwarding it. Instead, you want to do the opposite, which is called cut through, which is that when you receive a packet, as soon as you can make a decision about which port to send it on, you should start forwarding it while you're still receiving it. So if you want to do that, what field do you need to look at in order to make that decision? The destination address. So let's look at the IPv4 header. There's all this junk in there, and the absolute last thing in the header is the destination address. Let's look at the IPv6 header. <laughs> Again, the absolute last thing is the destination address. So parting thoughts. Don't believe anything about technology X unless there's a plausible inherent reason for it. Don't get carried away by buzzwords. So when somebody is saying, oh, this new thing will transform the world, unless you really know what the thing is, don't get excited about it. And I can assure you there are buzzwords floating around that there's really nothing behind it. Maybe people will invent things and give it that name because the name was so successfully marketed. And the last thing um, is a lesson. In my book, I try to give sort of um, real world examples to um, make um, the points I'm trying to make very clear. So um, um, the, this is the anecdote that um, you know, people remember the most, um, but, and it's absolutely 100% true. Um, the point I was trying to make is you really should know what problem you're solving before you try to solve it. And there's a problem in this industry that people just get all excited, roll up their sleeves, start writing code to handle the few special cases they've thought of, and then there's more cases, they add more code, you have this huge complicated thing, whereas I think you should first take a deep breath and figure out what problem you're solving. And the anecdote that will forever make you remember why you should know what problem you're solving before you try to solve it is that when my son was three, he ran up to me crying, holding up his hand, saying, my hand, my hand. So I took it and I kissed it a few times. What's the matter, honey? Did you hurt it? And he said, no, I got pee on it. <laughs> <laughs> so is there time for questions? Yeah. Uh, bueno, si alguno tiene alguna, tenemos por ahí unos cinco minutos para hacerle eh, preguntas a Radia. Les pido que quien tenga preguntas se acerque a los micrófonos que están eh, por los costados. My headphones are hopelessly tangled, so uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, yes. So, thanks for this excellent presentation, Raya. So, do you think that considering the amount of routing table entries that could be required if we were using CLNS would scale for the current internet because of the amount of local area networks and, and, and nodes and particular situ situations where aggregating resolves several problems and reduces the amount of entries in the routing table. So what right. So the question is, would the CLNP thing scale because you're routing to the individual end nodes? And the answer is absolutely yes. It's only inside of the cloud that you have to figure out where all the end nodes are. The top 14 bytes are just a hierarchy. Oh, okay. I actually even finished on time. Good for me. Because <laughs> um, the screen went blank, so I couldn't tell how many minutes there were uh, left. Um, yeah, so in terms of hierarchy, nobody outside of a cloud needs to know about where all of the end nodes are. You're only routing based on the top 14 bytes, which is just, an, just like IP would. 
And it's only when you get to the cloud that you have to worry about where all the end nodes are. So a particular cloud can only scale so far. But people did this. I mean, this is how DeckNet worked with hundreds of thousands of nodes inside of that cloud. So it, um, and by the way, Trill actually um, doesn't have to keep track of the end nodes inside. Only the guys at the edge have to figure out where the end nodes are. But um, scaling is not a problem because a cloud might have a limit to how much it can scale, but it certainly will be more than a single link, which is all IP allows you to make a flat address-based cloud. Okay. Alguna pregunta más? Sí. Right, so I'll be around. People can talk to me. Hello. Great. We have one yes. Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, talking about certificates, uh, DNS, and uh, identification, uh, authentication, do you think the Dane project could be a solution for that? The DNA project? Right. Oh, I'm trying to remember what, was that the thing where you sign email messages? Wait, explain what Dane is yes. again. Yes, uh, Dane project is uh, the use of DNSSEC uh, to, to, to have a different use for create certificates to other, ah, other, yes. Other okay. I am a real fan of DNSSEC. Um, it seems like a very sensible, lightweight way of creating signed information. So inside DNS, <laughs> you would put a name and a public key, and, um, and it's signed by, by the zone. So that's exactly the same as a certificate. So when, but whenever, <laughs> don't get me in too much trouble here. Whenever I suggest this, people say, shh, Radia, yes, we know, this would be a great use of it, but we're afraid if people find out that it could be used for that, they'll shut down our working group. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Bueno, eh, les pido un aplauso entonces para Radia.